we had a very large place in the north of Russia that came from my mother's side. It was called Rajesunsky. It was about 180,000 acres of forests and villages. And uh, there we used to generally go to pass some months in uh, summer. My father used to stay longer because he used to see about the cuttings of the woods and things like that. And uh, I remember we used to have a lot of animals and once one had brought a little bear that was absolutely charming that we didn't want to kill. The mother had been killed, but that little bear had been saved. And we kept him as a pet. And he used to be very funny because he used to come into the dining room when we used to have our meals and ask for little bits of bread or things. And if we didn't give him quick enough, he used to catch hold of the tablecloth and pull it and everything used to come crashing down. But he finished extremely badly because one summer it was very dry and the the peasants had asked for prayers to be said for the rain to come and when the priests and the banners passed not far from the house the little bear that was with us went out and started to walk on his hind legs between the banners and the priests and uh, the peasants thought that it was the devil or that anyway the rain would never come because of that bear and they rushed got hold of him and killed him luckily not in front of us Now the workers, who are still faithful to the cause of throwing off the capitalist yoke, call themselves communists. This union of communists is growing all over the world. And in a number of countries, Soviet power has already won. Not long from now, we will see the victory of communism everywhere. We will see the establishment of a worldwide federated republic of the Soviet. began in a typically Russian manner. As no one on the top would act, the revolution came more or less adventitiously from the bottom. It began haphazardly on March the 2nd in St. Petersburg, when the long queue of workers waiting for bread lost patience and sacked several shops. Out of the bread riot grew one strike and then another until the people began to feel their power. That was reason of revolt. The revolution started uh, certainly because there was no supply of food. That was start in on all February was already strikes in the factories uh, because of food. The women um, was standing in line, big line for food. You see, was not supplied. Was very bad. There was starvation. It was hunger was dogs and cats and rats was eating up. Mm -hmm. It was a terrible thing. Such a suffering human being, what they have, uh, I never see it in, in history. I never read in the books about such a kind of suffering. The Tsar's only reply was to prorogue the Duma. This time, however, it refused to dissolve and continued to demand a government enjoying public confidence. And this Duma, in the time of this revolt, proclaimed herself as provisional government. Prince Lvov, Rodzianko, and uh, Kerensky too as a coalition. Because parliament was fighting in a time of war to accept constitutional system of English manner. Liberals and Democrats was fighting for that 
constitutional, democratic government elected by parliament. There had been no difficulty about the Tsar. On March 15, he signed the act of abdication. It caused little excitement, but numbed the Tsar himself, who longed only to return to his wife and family. Like his cousin in Britain, King George V, he kept a diary. The laconic entry for March 16 was, it is cold and the sun shines. Tsardom had fallen like a house of cards before the puff of a child's breath. The first thing I remember of the revolution was the abdication of the Tsar. Uh, when my father called us all to his bed, he wasn't well, he, he had a cold or something, and uh, he was actually crying as he was reading the paper. My father was a Democrat and he hoped, of course, that this very unjust regime will be uh, replaced with something more uh, reasonable. And the uh, cook and the uh, servants and uh, I and my mother were all around him. And uh, he read to us that Nikolai uh, only wanted to go to his uh, palace in Crimea and he liked roses. It happened that very shortly after, my mother took me to the Crimea and I have seen, at least from far, that palace. I could understand that he wanted it very much because uh, Crimea was about the most beautiful place I ever saw in my life. capital was like the front. Everybody was happy. All the police stations had been gutted by fire, other buildings looked shabby, and there were holes in the pavements of the Nevsky. But among the people there was a sort of careless glory, and whatever the morrow might bring, today was always a birthday. Freedom had come alive again, and this time it would not die. An enormous number of public meetings were going on, not only in such large buildings as were available, but also in the streets. On ordinary days, meetings were held at intervals of about 300 yards up and down both sides of the Great Nevsky Prospect. Sometimes it was a student, sometimes a workman, sometimes a soldier who was doing the speaking. But whoever it was, was eager, optimistic and eloquent. All over the place, posters advertised meetings to be held in theatres and public halls. The public meeting was, for these rejoicing Russians, a delightful treat. In February, they organized, involuntarily originated such meetings on the street. And the Tsarist time it was forbidden. You cannot make on the street such a meeting. And this year, where we have empty place. You put the barrow in the middle of the uh, place, place in the middle of Moscow. I saw that myself. That was a tribune and everybody who wanted, who could uh, speak, he spoke about everything. How liberty is very good, how now is a new life, now happy, avail is the tyranny 
of the autocracy and so on and so forth. Everything, uh, what you know, the, uh, the workers are now uh, free. Uh, the socialists say that you have to finish the revolution. I heard a good story about one of these meetings. It took place at Saratov, down on the Volga. It was held in a great hall, and at the hour fixed for it to begin, the chairman addressed the packed audience, filling every chair on the floor and all the standing room at the back and sides. Comrades, he said, to she was already in fashion, comrades, there are hundreds of comrades outside who want to get in. Will those of you who have seats please move forward as far as you can? <clears throat> There was then a great scraping of chairs as everybody dragged his seat a few inches forward and room was made for a few hundred more eager listeners at the back. The chairman stepped forward again. Comrades, there are still comrades outside and many of them have never yet been able to attend a meeting. Will those of you who have already had a meeting please go out and give a chance to those comrades who have been less lucky? and some hundreds of people got up and walked out, leaving their seats for their unfortunate brethren who had never yet had the treat of being present at a political meeting. That's what the revolution meant in its early stages, a grand universal blowing off of long suppressed political steam. I was reminded of Wordsworth's lines about the French Revolution. Bliss was it then to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. amazingly unanimous, but in the general rejoicing, a few people had foreseen the real danger. The revolution had given birth to two rival powers, the Duma, which had waited too long, and the Soviets, the organized councils, which had won the allegiance of both the workers and the soldiers. What is the в чем заключается сущность этой новой власти, которой не хотят или не могут понять ни в чем большинстве стран? What is Soviet power? What is the essence of this new power, which people in many countries still resist and refuse to understand? The strength that attracts more and more workers from every land is derived from the fact that previously a state was managed one way or another by the rich and the capitalists. But now, for the first time, the state is managed in large numbers by the classes who were oppressed by the capitalists. Lenin, I saw him spoken by a Finnish uh, railroad station. They call it Filansky Vokzal in Leningrad. He was uh, spoken on these heavy trucks, these big, heavy uh, cars, uh, you know, on platform. He was spoken to the people. I was uh, 11, 12 years old, but I was listening. He was talking about proletaria, about workers, that's uh, how bad for the Tsar, 
on uh, how well good it's going to be if the communism is going to be. And then Lenin comes there and they talk to all people. And then uh, they brought him with the railroad, but uh, all closed, you know. Uh, nobody can shoot him. They brought him there and told he want communism be in all world, not only in Russian. But what we uh, we work for this and we have this. He told to the farmers, um, everybody had, um, you become your uh, more earth, you know, have to work so much and take the earth from all the big farmers, you know, it was a pomestic in Russian. Lenin, he is a man of extraordinary willpower, absolutely convinced that he has the full truth, that he was he thinks that is the only truth, and if someone is of an other opinion, it is very bad. But in the same time, in all his behavior, in all his life, very modest. That was my impression of him always. He spoke like a man who understands the psychology of a simple man. And his ideas were so unusual, so fantastic, that if you heard us, a crazy man, but uh, he does not care. He speaks once, he told you, this is a crazy idea. In three minutes, he repeats that in another variation. Three minutes later, once again, in a different variation, he hit you with a hammer. The same idea in your head. And the first time, you think that is a crazy idea. In the second, you are not so bewildered, not so surprised. You heard that also. In the third time, you know, oh, I heard that only. And the fifth time, in the end of this speech, what well, could be? I don't admit that. All right. But that's an idea, not so unusual or not so fantastic, because you are accustomed to that. During his speech, that is his manner. By insisting, 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 repeating, repeating, repeating. Without all this eloquence, no, that he does not like. Nothing. Very simple, very clear, very clear. And the Bolsheviks immediately cried, provisional government have to finish war first. Finish war, immediately stop war. Second, immediately give land to, to the people, all land to the, to the peasants. That was second. And the factory to the workers. The October, you have to think not on the general situation of the civil population, but of the situation of the army and the military situation. The military situation was very bad, already in year 16. And that is one of the direct causes of the uh, revolution. And uh, this created the central problem of the revolution. The central problem was to finish with the war. If the government could finish the war and uh, to go over to peaceful life, it would be much easier to improve the general situation, and it would be possible to distribute the land among the peasants. As it was impossible, and why it was impossible, I will tell you, the situation deteriorated, the mood of the peasants deteriorated, and then came the success of the Bolsheviks who used it. And to finish the war, it was impossible without agreement of our allies. If it would be reached, if it would have such a peace in the summer 1970, no Bolshevik revolution would be possible. It was the end of Kerensky. The bourgeoisie had long ceased to support him and was now divided in its own view. 
Some prayed for Allied intervention. Others hoped that the Germans would save them. And yet others, confident that the Bolshevik regime could not last a month, believed that a short reign of Bolshevism would be a good thing, because when it failed, there would be an end to anarchy. The only winner from this folly was Lenin. Returning secretly in his famous wig to Petrograd, he met the members of the Central Committee at a secret meeting, and after proposing an immediate armed rising, put the issue to the vote. Of the 11 present, only two, Kamenev and Zinoviev, voted against. The preparations for the coup were left to Trotsky, the outstanding man of action among the Bolsheviks. On November 7, the Bolsheviks struck. Troops and Red Guards occupied all the main buildings and stores. The cruiser Aurora trained her guns on the nearby Winter Palace. The ratings landed, entered the palace, and arrested all the ministers, except Kerensky, who had gone to seek in vain for reinforcements. Comrades, men of the Red Army, stand solid, steadfast, and in harmony. Fearlessly go forward against the enemy. The victory will be ours. The government of the land barons and capitalists, already smashed in Russia, will be defeated all over the world. Well, in the beginning, right at the beginning of the revolution, uh, when Kerensky was in the government with uh, another uncle of mine, the Prince Lvov, in the beginning it was more or less peaceful. And then when uh, the Tsar abdicated, we uh, saw that uh, things were really going very badly. And then Kerensky came once down to Odessa and I went out to, to listen to what he was saying. He spoke extremely well as a lawyer very fluently and well, and he persuaded everybody that everything was wonderful. And when he left, things began to grow worse and worse. And Odessa was taken by the Bolsheviks, and then our white troops uh, retook it back, and then we were again taken by the Bolsheviks. And in one of those occasions, uh, we were going to sit down to lunch when suddenly we heard uh, some uh, lorries getting into the, our courtyard, and the house was invaded by a whole troop of, of uh, soldiers uh, with rifles and uh, machine guns, and uh, uh, the head of them uh, said that uh, we were ought to be taken at once to the GPU or uh, more or less shot. And uh, my father said, but why? And he said, because you were at the head of the police. 
He had nothing, nothing to police. do with the police. So he uh, came and showed them photographs and things, and we were all in the drawing room, uh, uh, more or less to be shot. And then suddenly he had the idea of saying, but isn't it lunchtime? Perhaps you'd like to have something to eat. And they all looked at, at each other and said, but yes, on effet, it's lunchtime. And so we went uh, down. Luckily, everything was ready. The servants had all fled, and we gave them uh, some lunch. And they said, but you are charming people. We don't understand why you have to be shot. So they left uh, one chap, and they went off to see if really we had to be shot. And that chap, uh, my father gave him a quantity of wine, because we had a place in Bessarabia with a lot of vineyards, and we had always a lot of wine in the house. And he got completely drunk. And we didn't wait for the Bolsheviks to come back. We went at the other end of the town where we had our racehorses and for some time stayed over there. And then the Bolsheviks were sent off again. And so th that time we were safe. It happened 25th October 1917. I was Secretary General of this Council of Republic. Our senses were in the Mariinsky Palace. Palace Mariinsky. That was a very uh, splendid palace of the Tsarist time. And suddenly, in the morning of this day, came a detachment of military men, and of the Red Guardian, that's the Bolsheviks party, and they stood uh, on the entrance, uh, looked in the face of everybody who passed. There were many generals, there were many professors, many who later was proclaimed enemies of people like me. They did not arrest somebody. Nothing happened. And uh, all our documents was seized. And we left the palace. And that was closed forever. That was 25th, about 2 o'clock. That was a conspiracy. That was the opposite to the February Revolution, where the people went to the streets. That was a people revolution in February. People, people's revolt. October, that was not people's revolt, but organized revolt. Of course, it would be false to say that people did not sympathize with the Bolsheviks. There were many who sympathized, many. The Bolsheviks had a great influence because what they promised, they will give peace, land and bread. If you promise a country in this position, in this situation, hungry, over time, over exhausted with the war and longing for land distribution, if you promise peace, land and bread. During the February Revolution, everybody was on the street. The people uh, kissed each other. The people was gay. They enjoyed and delighted. They were happy, something happened. Now that is different. Here, the streets were empty, more or less. I cannot say that that is absolutely empty, but the people preferred to sit at home because it was uncertainty. What happened? Nobody knows. What something happened? Everybody knows because these so people, armed people, the military men, the red armies, they was always the guns. Uh, that is not uh, usual, that is not normal. Everybody prefers to be at home. And the expression of the face was very sad, because everybody understood that something happened, and very unpleasant. My mother entrusted me often my little brother, and. Uh, I used to take him to a park, which is called Chistaprudne Boulevard. I had to return because I heard shooting, like um, machine gun, ta-ta-ta-ta-ta, like that, from the roofs. And so I ran home. We also had to stand sometimes in the corridor of our apartment 
because of the shooting. I remember when the silence fell and the battle was over, an uncle of mine called me to ask if I wanted to see his son, my cousin. And uh, of course there was no transportation. And I walked to the hospital where my cousin was being cared for. And we crossed one of the fairly large streets of Moscow where there had been a battle the day before, and I remember there was blood running in the gutters because one end of the street was held by the Bolsheviks and the other by the officers. Also, it became very, very scarce food, and I remember that the ration of bread was something incredible. It was something like a one eighths or fourths of a pound a day, and it had straw in it, just sticking out of black bread, so that my father started to buy cocoa and flour and sugar in quantities to put it aside. And he said he was afraid of the uh, employees who would denounce him. Well, I don't see specialists shooting, but I can tell you some picture what I see. I never can forget it. We was a couple boys, about five or six, when I went to school together. There was one Finnish boy from Finland, and he was so hungry, and he was looking uh, for food. On somewhere he went, he find some uh, fish or herring somebody throw out. This fish was uh, inside warm alive on no use that can be used for food to eat. But he was so hungry. He ate that whole thing. We do worms in life. I never can forget that. There was nowhere to get any money and well, uh, those who remained in their homes, and we did remain for about two years, I think, in our house, uh, we had things that we could barter. See, peasants didn't want to sell anything for money, and mostly the people who had had money didn't have any money anymore. But the peasants came with bags of wheat or of rye or of potatoes or any kind of food. And they bartered that for clothes, for pieces of material, for, uh, I remember that we took off gradually the curtains on the windows, then uh, the um, green cloth on the billiard table, and all this was bartered for food. That's uh, how one could live. So it, you have to pay $1,000 for one lemon or something like this. 1,000 rubles, you see, 1,000 rubles. Uh, 500 rubles for, for a piece of bread or something. That's inflationary money. We started, uh, first of all, not to find any food. I remember perfectly well uh, the cook being at his wit's ends to find something to eat. And one day, uh, I remember very well, he rushed out in his pinafore, a white pinafore, with an enormous knife. And so we asked him, but Piotr, where are you going? And he said, oh, I've heard that there's, there's some meat to be got. And the meat, you know what it was? It was a poor horse that had uh, collapsed. I hope he was dead. But anyway, everybody rushed out from the different houses uh, and uh, came back with uh, big bits of meat, which I'm afraid we ate.
The tenant farmer does not exploit another man's labor, nor does he profit on another man's account, as does the kulak farmer. The tenant farmer works by himself, and he lives from the earnings of his own labor. He says, the Bolshevik says, we give you land, now you give us food. <laughs> you see? And immediately they send the food commissar. Everything has a commissar. And this commissar, there's a food commissar. They have to make provision, otherwise it'd be a hundred people in the city. So the Soviets, in every city, Soviet send the food commissars to, uh, to the farmers, to the villages. And they have to collect that, and that immediately, naturally, the peasants don't like that. And um, they have, not far from Kharkov, there was big farmers, intelligent uh, people, they kill seven from mama's side, you know, from my mother's side. They come in and say, uh, get out from here. The earth belongs to us. The Lenin told them. And they killed them. This is in my family, mm. but they killed everybody. And that moment they says that a small enterprise, they have no exploitation, uh, independent, mm. but they don't want that exploitation. You have not to have employed people. There's a small, small business could be. After the revolution was on the way, my father complained that the situation in the pharmacy changed as far as the employees were concerned. They were not only not obedient, but they were shameless enough to steal merchandise like perfume in his own pharmacy and he couldn't do a thing about it. They would say he is a capitalist because he actually was a Democrat and he d didn't own the house. I mean, all he had is his pharmacy. Catastrophe. That was catastrophe for Kerensky and catastrophe for Bolshevik because you know that in uh, 21 already started hunger and the Volga, millions of people, each, uh, even each, each another, cannibalism was that. In, you see, in uh, 17, 18, 19, and 20, it was misery already. But 21 was terribly hunger. So far, I have hunger. I have cold. I have no clothes. Or not me alone, because all the people was uh, suffering the same way. I was witnessed on the street following people from hunger. They don't have what to eat for, for weeks. They fall like a flies. 
so I don't think so these people was happy about it or all things was going on. Oh, well, what I cannot tell you. My grandmother never met Lenin, but uh, when the revolution broke out, she wanted to go from Moscow where she was uh, with uh, one of my uncles. She wanted to go to Fal, the place in Estonia, and uh, she sent her footman to the station to get, uh, as usual, a private carriage to travel. And uh, the footman came back saying, Princess, I'm very sorry. Uh, the, at the station they laughed and said, oh, what is this uh, invention? There's a revolution, there's no private carriage for anybody. And so my grandmother, quite upset and furious, wrote a word to Lenin and sent her footman with the letter. And he was introduced uh, and Lenin, after having read the letter, I suppose found it very amusing and funny, or was rather surprised, and gave the order to, for my grandmother to have the carriage. So uh, she had uh, th that carriage hooked on to the train as usual, and she uh, told my other uncle, the Prince Peter Volkonsky, well, you see, you tell me there's a revolution, perhaps, but anyway, I have got that carriage, and I'm leaving after tomorrow. And then when she arrived uh, to Petersburg, where my uncle had hidden uh, some of her jewels under the parquet of the drawing room floor, she had the butler, Seppi, undo everything and sent the jewels to Lenin with a word saying that she hoped that this would help him to go on with the war against the Germans. But she never saw him and that's all her connection with him. And then finally she went to Fall, which was a very beautiful place on the Baltic, where